Greetings, fellow Homo sapiens, and welcome to the Symbiotic Podcast. For this episode, we dive into the greatest unsolved mystery of 2020. Where did SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, come from? From the earliest days of the outbreak, the international community has wanted to know the details of precisely where, when, and how this virus emerged. The official story put forth by the Chinese government that the virus originated in a Wuhan wet market fails to give us a definitive picture and leaves many questions unanswered. The proximity of that particular wet market to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, China's highest security facility for studying viruses, has fueled speculation that the virus may have escaped from or even been created in a Chinese lab. As a result of this, we have seen multiple theories and politically motivated accusations fly in 2020. U.S. government officials blaming China, Chinese officials blaming the U.S. Army. All the while, the global scientific community has been struggling to do the hard work of science, trying to understand where this virus came from and how we might halt its terrifying toll on the world's population. Today's guests are part of that global community of scientists, All of them are members of Penn State's Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics, and all of them are deeply involved in ongoing international efforts to piece together a bigger picture of how and why new viruses emerge and spill over from other species to our own. Machik Boni is Associate Professor of Biology at Penn State. He analyzes the epidemiology and evolution of both human and avian influenza, and evaluates strategies to treat and prevent diseases, particularly in southern Vietnam. Sagan Friant is an associate professor of anthropology at Penn State. Her work focuses on the evolutionary anthropology of human health, disease ecology, nutrition, socio-ecological systems, and bushmeat hunting through field research in Nigeria. And Peter Hudson is Willimon Professor of Biology at Penn State and former director of the Huck Institutes of the Life Sciences. Much of Hudson's work has implications for the control of wildlife diseases and emerging zoonotic disease across the globe. I hope you'll enjoy this lively conversation about the possible origins of SARS-CoV-2, wildlife spillover, and the factors that drive the emergence of new diseases, some of which have nothing to do with laboratory science at all. Hello, folks. Thanks so much for being on the Symbiotic Podcast today. It's a real honor to have you all uh, on the show with us. Thank you so much for your time. Um, All of you are are from Penn State. All of you uh, are members of Penn State's uh, Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics, and uh, that's a very collaborative interdisciplinary space. And um, though we're not going to talk today about a specific project that you all worked on together, we are going to like uh, benefit from your collective knowledge around this whole topic of where do viruses come from? Specifically, where did SARS-CoV-2 come from and other similar viruses? How does spillover occur? You know, um, it's, it's such a, an important topic globally right now. Um, just this month on November 3rd, to be exact, uh, David Relman from the Department of Medicine at Stanford published an opinion piece in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences titled, To Stop the Next Pandemic, We Need to Unravel the Origins of COVID-19, right? And um, that, that, that's, a, that's a huge Im- important thing that people are working on internationally uh, in his piece He puts forth the fact that we need to put politics aside and we need to be transparent and we need to work as an international scientific community to get down to the origins of of this virus. And one of our guests today, uh, Matt Ciboni, uh, recently published a paper just at the end of July of this year in collaboration with an international team of scientists in the journal Nature Microbiology. And this paper is on the evolutionary origins of the virus. So uh, Magic's going to be leading off our conversation today to get us into that topic. Also, I'll mention that uh, Magic was featured in a video produced by Business Insider called How We Know the Virus, excuse me, How We Know the Coronavirus Wasn't Made in a Lab. And we're going to share uh, the link to both that paper and the video in the notes to this podcast. So Magic, a question for you. 
Uh, in spite of all the various theories floating around out there, alleging that SARS-CoV-2 escaped from a Chinese lab, either accidentally or on purpose, there seems to be a general scientific consensus that this is not the case. Can you please tell us why? Sure. So, yes, what, what you said is accurate. The, the general scientific consensus is that the virus uh, crossed over from animal populations, specifically bat populations, into humans in some part of China, and, and we're just not sure where. Uh, the, the genetic link exists showing us which uh, bat populations and which uh, bat lineages it would have uh, crossed over from. Um, and the reason that this is a consensus among scientists is that these types of crossing over, these types of emergence events have happened a lot in the past. So we've seen avian influenza viruses jump from geese to humans. Ebola viruses jump from uh, bats to people. We've seen MERS jump from camels to people. So these are pretty common occurrences. And once you've got the genetic links, it's a, a perfectly normal conclusion to come to. So to address some of these other possibilities, could it have uh, come from a lab? And if it did, was it intentional or was it an accident? So th these are worth discussing. So laboratory accidents do happen. So the, the 1977 Russian flu that caused an influenza pandemic, that was either a laboratory accident or an accidental release from a clinical trial. There was a 1978 uh, smallpox accident where in the UK, a smallpox virus escaped from a lab and infected a, a few people, a very small number of people, but still potentially very dangerous. So these things happen, it's, it's necessary to investigate them. We won't have access to records, of course, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is where the purported escape would have occurred. But we also don't see any signals that, uh, that are common with a lab escape. So, for example, there's no cases uh, among the staff at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There were no cases of respiratory disease or pneumonia or certainly any confirmed viral infections. And everybody tested antibody negatives, indicating that the virus didn't infect any individuals that worked there. So then when you read the news, people will reply and they'll say, well, you know, it was all covered up. And when you start having this discussion, you quickly see that it's a little difficult to convince people uh, because there's always this answer that it could have been a, a cover-up. The, the problem is that th this is a pretty challenging cover-up to put together. So imagine that uh, the virus accidentally escaped from a lab and it began infecting a, you know, a few employees and a few scientists that worked there, and then maybe their family or their, their contacts. You wouldn't really know that any of this happened until three, four, five weeks later, people started showing up in hospitals with some unidentifiable pneumonia. And then after this unidentifiable pneumonia was kind of flagged as important, it would take another few weeks to sequence the virus and develop a diagnostic. So now you're already six or seven weeks into this epidemic, and you're now going to have to do a cover-up that goes back in time and covers up all these cases that have already been reported to health systems and possibly reported internationally. So I don't, I don't really see how someone could have pulled off this type of cover-up. Um, the, I think the final hypothesis that is talked about is that this was intentionally released. I don't really understand why someone thinks it would have been, it would have benefited China to release a virus accidentally in its own population and out to the world. And how would they know that the virus was deadly? How would they know that? the virus could transmit from person to person. So unless they were doing experiments on people and you know, to suggest something like this, you need uh, some body of evidence to suggest that something extraordinarily unethical and, and horrific was being done. They, they wouldn't know that this was a virus that had the possibility to spread this way. So it's talked about a lot, but until somebody produces some evidence on the laboratory origin hypothesis, the best evidence points to this being a natural occurrence from animal populations to human populations. Thank you. Appreciate you digging deeper to uh, break that out for us. Sure thing, Cole. How, how do you even determine the origin of a virus? Let's, let's dig in here. Sure. So to determine the origin of anything, you, you've got two tools to start with. You start with the genetics and fossils. And uh, with viruses, obviously, you don't have a, you know, a huge opportunity to look at fossil evidence, but it's not, it's not zero. You can sometimes find viruses and uh, frozen corpses that you can look at from 100 years ago. But the majority tool uh, you have for viruses uh, is genetics. 
So you have to be able to know how quickly the virus is evolving, and then you have to use that speed of evolution to kind of be able to look back in time to see at what point in time it crossed some boundary. It uh, changed from one form to another, or maybe moved from, from one population to another population. So if a virus has been circulating only in humans, uh, this is really difficult uh, because there's no origin that you can look for if you only have human evidence of transmission. You can just kind of point to viral circulation and say it's always been in humans. And the methods that allow you to look backwards, uh, they don't really allow you to look back more than about 100 years. Viruses evolve very quickly, so 100 years of viral evolution is a, a lot of evolution. So the, the situation where you can actually determine origins uh, for human viruses is where you have a virus that's been circulating in humans and in animal populations. And the game or the trick here is to find a virus in animal populations that's similar to viruses that are already in human populations. And then you use genetics and the rate of evolution to start uh, decoding uh, how quickly or how recently and also maybe how often it's been jumping from animal populations into human populations. So there is another approach there, isn't there, Magic? So I, I totally accept what you say, but in some instances, we can actually use epidemiology and tracing to find out who patient zero has been. So in uh, infections, and I work on the hendrovirus infection, we know, for example, the horse that got infected and then the first person who got infected with the virus or the first, or we, that we believe, so we can actually see the virus in both the horse and the person, and then we have to find the wildlife host. So it's yeah, epidemiological tracing can help you in certain circumstances. And that's the real issue here with COVID-19, with SARS-CoV-2. We don't know the individual that first got infected. And I suspect, but I don't know, that there are political issues, but well, there are huge political issues around that. But it would be very nice to do the tracing. And I wonder if the Chinese have done this in Wuhan to identify the early people in this, uh, in this uh, pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So Pete's right about that. If, if you have everything in front of you, if you have a surveillance system that uh, in real time is looking at the human infections and the animal infections and, and you're logging movements of animals, say, from some farm to another where you know there were or weren't infections, then you can just use all this epidemiological data uh, to see in you know this matter of weeks, probably, uh, how the infection jumps from one population to another. I would also say that kind of the standard epidemiological approaches and using um, a certain number of questions and surveillance can be a little bit limiting. So in a lot of viruses, so I work on um, a virus called monkeypox that we know is transmitted from actually rodents, most likely, um, but we don't really know the host range. So similar to coronavirus, there's a, a limit to our knowledge. And so trying to find those initial cases where the virus has spilled over into people uh, and then doing really in-depth analysis, um, not just contact tracing, but ethnographic work that looks at how humans in environments where viruses are spilling over the diverse ways that they interact with wildlife kind of as a starting point to even inform uh, more quantitative epidemiological approaches and kind of form those questions that we can ask at a broader scale. So Sagan's point brings us forward and says, what are the surveillance mechanisms that we actually need in place? And it seems to me so blatantly obvious that we need to be doing surveillance of people at the human wildlife intersection. And, you know, Sagan was referring to some types of people who, who may have contact with dead animals and things like this. Obviously, those people in wet markets in places like Wuhan should have surveillance taking place. Doing surveillance for the virus itself is not always a sensible thing because an infection can last just a few days. And unless you miss that infection, as we know for COVID-19, you're not going to get a, you're not get, that isn't the right response variable you should do. But now with developments in looking at serology and antibodies, and I'm thinking, of course, here, Magic Sagan about Verscan, we should be using the sort of Verscan type approach to see what people have been uh, uh, exposed to. So we should be banking samples, I think, in the surveillance systems for the future. 
Yeah, I agree completely. So much of the surveillance and the settings that I work are conducted in hospital settings. So you're really, uh, your knowledge on what is emerging in these settings is limited to people who can physically report to hospitals. And there's so many social and environmental barrier variables uh, especially in rural areas where a lot of uh, viruses are emerging that mean that people aren't reporting to hospitals. So you're missing so much information uh, and only getting uh, those that are able to seek health care um, in establishments that are able to detect novel infections. So there's a lot of barriers there. And, and are these barriers common to all coronaviruses? I know, uh, Matchik, you and I had an exchange about um, the origin of viruses is tough to begin with, but for coronaviruses, it's particularly tough. Is it, is it because of the things that you all have been like breaking out just now? Are there yeah, others? that's right. And, you know, there have been three coronaviruses that have emerged into human populations in the last 20 years. And two of them had uh, low transmission and a trickle of cases and because that transmission was low, we were able to take an epidemiological approach to start looking at animal markets and camel farms to see where these spillover events were happening. If you have a dozen cases, you can begin an epidemiological investigation like that. But if you have 5,000, you can't, not only because of the number, but the, if you have 5,000 cases, the origin was six weeks ago. You've, you've missed everything. For uh, for SARS-CoV-2, that's what happened. We missed everything. Transmission was too high. We did not detect it at the first seven cases. We detected it at the first 40 cases, but those 40 were probably from a group of several thousand that had uh, developed pneumonia and were at a hospital. So on December 30th last year, when the first report came out, it was already six weeks too late. Mm -hmm. This is partly why I think David Raymond's paper in PNAS is actually wrong. We do not actually need to know the origin of this virus to prevent the next outbreak, because the next outbreak could maybe a beta coronavirus or it could be some other type of virus taking place. So we don't actually need to know the origin of this to prevent the next one. But what we need to do is we need to understand the drivers why these diseases are emerging, and we also need to understand when and how they're spilling over. And wet markets is an obvious place where they spill over because people are coming into close contact with wild animal species, and that is not a sensible thing to do. Do not, so it's very easy to say, and we said this back in 2003, don't eat bats or civet cats, you know? And the Chinese were meant to stop doing that, but they turned a blind eye to what was happening. I see. Well, let's get into the mechanics of spillover a little bit for, for people who, who don't. I mean, I think in the popular consciousness, you just go, okay, you eat, you eat a bat, the bat gets you sick. Is it really that simple? Or what, what are some of the other mechanics of the ways that zoonotic spillover happens where, where these viruses move from, from animals to people? Are there many, many different routes and uh, because I've heard it's what 60 70 percent of, of viruses we deal with have some sort of spillover element from from animals to people is that correct yes and I suspect that most of our infections so you look at things which are considered human specialist infections like measles and if you use this sort of magic approach you would say well this spilled over from rinderpest because we can follow it back as it were but using genomics and similarly we know for HIV came from chimpanzees and in my study, which is on hendroviruses that come from bats into humans, they use horses as a bridging host. So the bats infect the horses, and then the horses infect the humans. And similarly, in Nipah virus we work on, the bats infect palm sap that people then drink. So there's always an intermediate in each of these cases. I think a very important question is, why is this taking place now? Mm. And the research that I'm doing with my colleague, Raina Pyrite, is showing that what is really taking place is that we're losing habitat, we're losing resources for the bats to feed on, and as a consequence of this, they're starving. And when they're short of resources, that's when they start shedding virus. They move into these poor habitats, they change their behavior, they often move into urban areas, increasing their contact with humans, increasing their contact with peri-domestic hosts, such as the horse or your dog or your rat or the rats and mice that live in your house. And 
that that spillover then results in the virus actually reaching through to you. So going back to the Relman paper, he has he suggests there's two routes that COVID came in. And he says one of those is through a, a bridging host, an intermediate host, or it was a direct infection of a human that got into a lab. Well, I can think of multiple other routes of infection that took place. And we know that with SARS-CoV, well, we know with beta coronaviruses that in Wuhan, where we think the bat would have come from, that we ha there have been previous spillover cases taking place. Now, I'm not saying that was SARS-CoV-2, but a similar beta, but, as, but probably a beta coronavirus from the serology data that was published from there. I see. And, and much like with that paper we just talked about a minute ago, um, what were your, your core findings that we could share with our audience? And we'll, we'll do a link to that paper as well in our notes. Well, I, I didn't think there was very much new in that paper. I mean, Pete, if there's, if there's something I'm missing, please just, uh, and Sagan as well, please just let me know. But I mean, since 1997, the emerging infectious disease community has been on alert for emerging viruses. And there have been uh, dozens, probably scores of examples where there have been spillovers that have been addressed with epidemiological means because they happen in front of you and you can trace them. There have been dozens of cases where you don't get to see the immediate spillover, but you see it a few weeks later and you begin tracing it with genetics. Some of these have turned into pandemics. Uh, some turned into large regional epidemics. And uh, all of them have, uh, after the epidemic and the, the postmortem, have turned back into that initial moment when things were ignored, when they shouldn't have been, when there was a spillover occurring from animal into human populations. They do invariably uh, get back to human and animal contacts, uh, into market situations. But it's also true that every single spillover is, is different. The, 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 the social and biological factors around the avian influenza spillover are different than for Ebola virus or, or Lassa virus. So, I mean, each one does need its own sort of program around it to see which parts are capable of being surveilled. Uh, and on which side of the animal-human boundary we sort of get the biggest benefit of paying attention right there. And Sagan, I, you know, I, you're doing this work. What's what's the type of work you can do around Lhasa surveillance that allows you to to detect the the, the first signals of a of a spillover? So Lhasa virus is a rodent-borne hemorrhagic fever virus, uh, and it's. Luckily, <laughs> um, as far as we can tell, it's primarily a single host system, which makes it a lot easier to understand because you're just looking at human interactions with a single animal, not a whole uh, ecological community or a known group of animals. Uh, and so surveillance, similar to what P was saying before, is uh, looking at antibody responses. So you have a large number of infections that don't actually result in any clinical symptoms. So you have people getting infected with loss of virus and um, at that point of spillover um, with limited human to human transmission. Uh, so it means that it's actually a pretty tangible system in which we can understand the spillover process because a majority of the infections are coming from the reservoir host. Now this is different from coronavirus, which may be a single spillover event than a, a transmission chain that leads to a global pandemic or same with HIV AIDS or Ebola. So um, looking at systems like this in which you can actually study human rodent contact and look for risk factors for transmission um, are pretty unique when studying spillover and really helpful to, um, to understand. And then one thing, um, I'm a, in the anthropology department, so I'm interested in more of the nuances of human behavior. So looking beyond kind of these simple tallies of human wildlife contact and epidemiological risk factors to the ways that humans construct and modify their environments, um, similar to what Peter was saying with uh, Hendra virus, uh, that it's human modifications on the environment that can have downstream effects on shedding of the virus. Well, in the Lhasa system, you see um, humans almost constructing the ecological niche for the reservoir host through agricultural practices. So a lot of the reservoir biology is tied to uh, human behaviors that 
plant all the food for the rodent and then all of a sudden harvest all the food for the rodent and store it in the house. And then all the rodents can come into the house uh, where all the food has gone. So the population dynamics and the rodent movement and the contact uh, in the household setting is influenced by a wider variety of human environment interactions. Uh, and this is true of a lot of spillover processes. Uh, and so agreeing with what was said before is I don't think that we need to know the origins of SARS. I mean, we all want to know the origins of SARS-CoV-2, uh, but this is part of a much broader pattern that people are studying in systems globally, including uh, here in the US with Lyme disease. And so this is something that we were starting to get a handle on and uh, something that we know is happening and we know is happening at an increasing frequency. So we have the knowledge, um, we're still missing a lot of knowledge and that leaves a lot of productive room for research, um, but it's part of a larger pro uh, a part of a larger um, problem and elucidating the origins of SARS-CoV-2 will help contribute to our understanding, but it's not going to have a fundamental shift in our understanding of spillover because we know that these wildlife markets um, are really important um, areas for mixing viruses between animal hosts and between animal hosts and human hosts. And Sagan's work here is really important because it's bringing human behavior and an understanding of the biology, virology, and dynamics of these emerging diseases together. And there's been a real, you know, there's been a real uh, block between those. And this is something, this bringing the social and life sciences together, even in the bigger context, is extremely important. And this is, this is the way we, we're gonna have a be better insights into it, very important. Absolutely. You know, I hear you both uh, echoing some comments that were made back in February at the very, there wasn't even called a pandemic yet. When this thing first kind of hit, uh, we had several of your colleagues from SID on. Um, we had uh, Matt Ferrari and, and Beth McGraw and Nina Barty. And we, we talked about encroachment into wild spaces. We talked about this more anthropological, ecological view, the social piece of it, uh, whether or not you're eating bats in a wet market, wh where you're building your houses, where you're disrupting ecosystems. And it seems like that's where we have to get to with this. Uh, I agree. You know, There's a lot of noise out there uh, on the internet and, and all over the place in terms of where did this thing come from? And, and it does get politicized and, and people can get it go down all sorts of rabbit holes with that. But, but it, I agree with you that to step back and have this broader context of all the different forces at play is ultimately going to take us to a better place where we can do better as a society, as an emerging global society, particularly, right, to um, help prevent more of these things from happening. So um, with that in mind, um, or, or do we even have enough understanding of spillover at this point to be able to start uh, predicting it or, or preventing it? Where, where are we with that, in your opinion? So I do think actually making predictions about things you have no data on is, is almost impossible. So to actually make predictions about SARS-CoV-2 would have been, would have been uh, totally and utterly impossible to my mind. And that Mind you, we can come up with the bigger things and say, you know, if you're going to get infected, you're going to get infected if you start eating bats. You're going to get infected if you start removing your forests and you'll get these animals are going to be dying, etc. With the Hendra virus system, we have been able to pick up a couple of signals that take place which have allowed us to predict uh, future outbreaks of the disease. And we and we've done this a priori for the last two outbreaks. We predicted where and when the outbreaks are going to occur because we see changes in the climatic conditions that help that drive what the bats actually do. And we also start to see signals in the reproduction of the bats. And we start to see signals where people who are bat carers in Australia have an increase in the number of babies they're taking in. So when we look at those signals, we can say we believe there's going to be an outbreak. And, and that's worked really well for the past two outbreaks. And then we had an outbreak this year, which we predicted was going to take place, and it didn't take place. And the really nice thing was that there was an unexpected flowering of a tree that we didn't expect to be flowering this year, but it flowered at just the right time and saved the bats' resources so they didn't starve. So it was 
It was like uh, we made the prediction, but of course we assumed that this isn't going to happen, and then it did happen. So that was that was quite nice. But that doesn't get us to the real mechanisms. Those are those are looking at signals of things that are going on that lead up to it. Those aren't saying, okay, you know, the the bats are like this, and the the virus is like this, and the landscape is like this, and the horses are hungry, so everything lines up. It's just taking signals out of that and saying that we can make uh, we can, we can make predictions. But as I said, they're not really mechanistic. Again, to hear you say that, it's fascinating to think that a tree could could come into the system and change everything, all those different factors at play. So we have to have a better map. We have to have a more nuanced map. We have to be able to map all these different factors. And then just to be able to see the, the patterns and read the signals, as you say, to, to be able to at least have a warning system, perhaps like an early warning system rather than a predictive system. Is that how you'd characterize yeah. that? And I, I mean, I'm going to say some challenges is this disconnect between. Uh, so you have these broad forecasting models that are that are looking at maybe these really broad scale markers of spillover. So land use change, poverty, um, population change. And then you have people like me doing these really small scale studies that often take place in a single village or a handful of villages. Um, that can really tease apart so, or tease apart what's happening in this one spot, but maybe it's really different over there um, in another state or another part of the world. Uh, and so what, we're, what we've been trying to do with Lassa virus is work together with these broad scale modelers who have kind of targeted these um, key axes of risk um, that look at Lassa fever uh, virus across Nigeria and trying to design local scale studies that help us understand how these broad scale risk factors actually translate into local scale processes. So what does it mean that Lassa virus is associated with poverty? Is it just, is it in rural areas or is it because poverty is associated with food insecurity uh, and those are the people who eat rats? Um, or is it that poverty is associated with the way you construct your house and that allows rodents to come in and infest your house? So trying to, um, or maybe how the environment that you build your house is on the outskirts of the community. There's all ways that these um, kind of predictive factors can translate to actual human wildlife interactions on the ground and trying to tease those apart in a way um, that helps these two scales work together and across levels and can feed into these broad scale models. Um, and then you can actually improve uh, your forecasting measures, whether it's a single disease system or some of these much broader efforts that are just trying to predict spillover in general at a global scale, um, which is very challenging. Institutes of the Life Sciences at Penn State offers six intercollege graduate degree programs in bioinformatics and genomics, ecology, integrative and biomedical physiology, molecular, cellular, and integrative biosciences, neuroscience, and plant biology. We also offer an accelerated professional science master's program in biotechnology. At the HUC, we immerse students in a groundbreaking environment built on interdisciplinary collaboration among some of the world's most innovative research scientists. And our students receive unparalleled access to bleeding edge technology in world-class core facilities. If you're looking for a deeper, more holistic grad school experience, you owe it to yourself to look at the HUC. Visit us online today at huc.psu.edu. It's, it's, it's a hyper-localized hyper thing that you're doing, but if the hyper-localized approach could then be distributed globally to the different environments, that maybe the principles could be applied to those, those specific places and ecosystems. Can you break out for our, our viewers and listeners just a little bit, Sagan? You know, that sounds fascinating um, as, you, as you're talking about a specific village and, and poverty, which again echoes what I heard from your SID colleagues back in February, that poverty is a huge factor that's left out of the equation and, and the conversation. We're all talking about vaccines and we're all talking about um, medication, et cetera but nobody's really looking at the underpinnings uh, broadly of, of disease coming forward where we have to talk about things like poverty. But could, could you just um, tell us a little bit more about your specific research in that village of what does that actually look like to people participating? 
Sure. Yeah, there's there's a concept in anthropology that I think is really helpful for just thinking about this in a more holistic manner, and it's called syndemics, so synergistic epidemics. Mm. It kind of extends the concept of comorbidity, so two diseases interacting to worsen each other, uh, to social issues like poverty, and you could theoretically even extend it to ecological issues. So you have these different um, epidemics, maybe of food security, um, that are also... Uh, working together with emerging infectious diseases and they're both exacerbated by it. Uh, and so in the example um, of poverty and lack of access to resources and globalization are all feeding in to a lot of these human wildlife interactions. So um, one of my study projects uh, focuses not on, it's kind of pathogen agnostic. So it doesn't focus on a specific pathogen, but it focuses on hunting of wildlife uh, in West Africa. Uh, hunting, which is known there as bushmeat, uh, and really focuses on understanding the larger social drivers of interaction um, between humans and wildlife through hunting, but also not through hunting, all the diverse ways that people interact with wildlife in these settings, uh, some of which is driven largely by poverty. And a lot, of, I think a lot of times people think about this as uh, People are hungry, so yeah, you can't take their food away from them. Um, but a lot of times these populations aren't even subsisting off of wildlife. Um, they're selling it for money to send their children to school or to uh, build a better house or to fix the roof. Uh, and so there's a large dimension of this wildlife trade that really uh, extends human wildlife interfaces beyond and the, the levels of contact beyond what you would normally see in a rural hunting community um, that is subsistence based because now you have these levels of extraction that are not only feeding this one rural village, but they're feeding uh, Calabar, the nearest city, they're feeding Lagos, the most populated city in all of Africa, and they're, and they're being flown to the US and Europe. Uh, and, and that's creating a really large amount of human wildlife contact. Uh, and, and in addition to that, people don't have access to healthcare. So they're looking to right to treat their diseases. So there's all these different forms of contact with wildlife uh, through hundreds of different types of medicinal uses that people uh, in one community are looking to wildlife to treat various illnesses that are also constructing different pathways of possible transmission and some of which may be riskier than just um, consuming, you know, the consumption of a cooked animal, maybe not that risky, but um, dealing with animal parts and, as rubs and ap applying them to different parts of the body and especially when they're in a raw condition um, can really facilitate potential transmission. So we're just trying to get a better idea of how that is influenced by where a village is and who a person is. So kind of looking within a single village, who hunts and who doesn't? Uh, is it you know, there's, there's a huge range of people and what, what makes one person decide to hunt and another person not to hunt. And I really came across this question um, before I was doing research. I was helping uh, with a conservation NGO and patrolling wildlife uh, and, or patrolling poachers. And the first hunter that I came across was a 15 year old boy who was um, almost at tears when he saw us walk up into the hunting shed uh, and he had a dead monkey. And this just blew away all of my preconceptions on what a poacher or a bushmeat hunter looked like. Um, and so these are often children. Uh, we found that, uh, you know, large family sizes and uh, low income and um, a certain age range all influence whether people hunt as part of their livelihoods, as well as family tradition in these areas. Um, and that maybe it's a lack of access to educational resources and livelihood opportunities that drive just a certain subsection of the population into hunting, which is not a desirable livelihood, um, while as others maybe have more capital or able to leave the community, um, engage in trade and other aspects that can um, help improve um, their livelihoods. And often, I'll just add finally, that hunting is can be a fallback livelihood. So um, having a hunter and another hunter and a non-hunter is a false dichotomy because many non-hunters will, during periods of food shortages or maybe there's a disease in their farm, will fall back on hunting um, for food and money. Uh, and so this is another driver that can increase human wildlife contact during periods of famine, um, for example. Got it. And, so that, yes. And many of the, 
many of those principles that Sagan so eloquently put out relate also to what's happening in COVID-19, where we see huge health disparities, educational disparities within this country. So different levels of exposure and different levels of susceptibility in different parts of our community. And I think uh, that the one amazing thing about this infection, this disease, is the massive heterogeneities we get in the differences in how people respond to the infection, their immune system varies, the social context, which is what Sagan's talking about, and how that, how that influences and shapes the way this disease uh, spreads it, across the population. Absolutely, the socioeconomic factors are enormous. Uh, whether we're talking about Africa or the, the United States of America, or, or which which virus or which infection we're talking about, Magic, what's your take on all this? Well, uh, on the spillover part, I can I'll relate it to the, the system that I've worked with most, which is avian influenza virus, and I can you know I can just give the listeners a, a, another example of an environment that you need to be able to just uh, look at in front of you, understand, study for a number of years to get a bit of a picture of how avian influenza viruses jump from, uh, from mainly chickens and ducks into humans. Um, this mainly occurs in Southeast Asia, in East Asia a little bit, in South Asia and Egypt also, but uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia have been the main countries where avian influenza viruses have crossed from um, poultry to humans. And the environment is really uh, millions of smallholder poultry farms. So uh, domestic poultry in people's houses, um, 10 chickens in one person's house, uh, 50 ducks in another person's house, which is a, a system that's very difficult to control because people don't uh, register ownership of a dozen ducks, uh, something that you might have for six weeks and then decide not to raise another flock again. But yet it's something that you need to be able to look at and control. You need to see how ducks and chickens go onto these farms and how they leave. You need to know where they go after they leave. Do they go to markets? Yes. And where are those markets? And you also need your very local animal health offices involved in all this surveillance because the Department of Health in the capital city isn't going to have their fingers into uh, a million small farms. You need the regional and district level uh, animal health offices communicating with farmers, uh, asking if there's been any disease recently, and then putting together some sort of response plans when there are outbreaks and, you know, in those outbreaks when there's risk of transmission from poultry to humans. Thank you for that. Yeah, yet another scene to paint the bigger picture. Wow, um, where are we here with time? We're about we're about 40 minutes into our talk. This has been fascinating. Um, we've, we've touched on um, origins, how, how important ultimately is it? Maybe it's too late to ever map out the the ultimate origins of SARS-CoV-2, but maybe we don't have to in, in order to, to do better uh, moving forward. And maybe we need to broaden our lens uh, internationally to move forward. How much international uh, cooperation do you folks experience w when we're trying to map out all these different factors? It would, it would seem to me you'd need a lot of different people with a lot of different skill sets all working together from the same playbook in order to put this, this map together and see, you know, make this early warning system, perhaps like how, give us some hope here. <laughs> How's the international scientific community doing with that? And how can we make it stronger and, and more resilient moving forward? So you bring up two really important points there. And one of those is that you need an interdisciplinary team to be able to, to do this. And that must include everybody from social scientists through to immunologists and virologists. So in our Bat One Health team, where we're looking at spillover from bats, and we've been working on it for, I guess, 10, 12 years now, uh, we have 40 PIs in, this, in our grants looking at this because we have people from every walk of life, including the people who are producing new novel vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. So I think an interdisciplinary approach is absolutely essential if you're going to get to grips with this. Your second component is that you do need to be involved with the people and the places where this is taking place. And Sagan's a beautiful example of that, what she's doing in Nigeria. And, uh, you know, I find it, I find it really gratifying to work with scientists in different parts of the country. And you really have to be there 
working with them, working with the local people to really understand the natural history of what's taking place. I mean, you can put all your samples and everything to one side, just go out there and spend time in the villages, talking to people, start catching the animals, start talking to people about their context. And then you see, okay, I think I understand what's taking place here. Now I just have to be able to show it. What data do I need and how are we going to be able to do that? And that does mean collecting samples of the virus and then moving those virus samples between you know, one country to this country is extremely difficult because of the, you know, the, the, the legislation and the restrictions on you. So sometimes you have to set up a whole new lab, as we have done in East Africa, for example, where we do all our bushmeat work, we do all the analysis there in the lab, we build a whole community of researchers, get that funded, just to be able to make sure we can get these things going. It's not easy, it's complex, and there's always difficulty about, you know, what the semantics of it. If I wasn't on this call, I would be arguing with some of my other colleagues, and much of that colleagues, much of that discussion comes down because they see their science I don't quite see what you're referring to and why you think that's important. So there's always this case of trying to embrace it. But hell, that's good fun. <laughs> Excellent. I agree. I think it, um, these interdisciplinary teams are so important. And it, in addition to people working within their own disciplines, having uh, people like ourselves, who I think all really appreciate the value of different disciplines and can work at least a little bit in between disciplines um, and try to facilitate that communication because a lot of time, an interdisciplinary team doesn't do much good if everyone's just going to go and write their own papers and not communicate about how they can really inform each other. And I think that that, um, in my experience, has been the most challenging and the most rewarding part of it is trying to inform each other's study design and also use the results together because there's this tendency to have these great teams, but then to go on and um, publish siloed papers uh, anyway. Uh, and so that that is really rewarding. And then I think also following what Peter was saying is that um, working with local people, not only to understand your system, but um, when you're trying to develop solutions and implement uh, local based or broad scale policies um, that will trickle down to a rural village in Africa or somewhere in Australia or uh, a wet market in China, there's these barriers that we may not be able to see to behavior change in these areas. Um, so working in a participatory way with uh, the people that you're that are at the forefront of that human animal interface to to know if your uh, intervention could even be successful. I always say that, you know, that the, the most promising intervention that a model produces, um, it may actually be the fifth best intervention that is the best intervention because that's the one that is actually implementable on the ground and will be accepted um, within governments or within by individuals. Uh, and so an intervention that is conceived uh, in a laboratory or behind a computer doesn't do much good if it's not, um, if there's really big barriers to uh, people on the ground. So a tangible example of this is this um, idea that we keep coming back to a food security. So uh, in the LASA system, there might be a win-win between food security and rodent control, because if you control rodents, um, they're major ecological competitors with humans. They're eating our food in agricultural settings and in pests um, and in the household settings. So there's actually, people are motivated to control rodents. Um, but if you tell them to stop hunting, uh, as my colleague Lena Moses says, the only thing that telling somebody to stop hunting a rodent does or stop eating rodent is change their answer um, from yes to no on a survey. <laughs> and, right. uh, so there's when they when they go against uh, what somebody wants to do and their motivations and benefits or co-benefits of these interventions are really, I think, important to consider to making them effective. Cole, of course, both magic and say are um, appointments that came through the Huck Institute because, and they are, they are interdisciplinary people. That's why they were, that's why they were brought here. Absolutely. Now we just need the Huck to help to transform uh, the global scientific effort and, and see more of that spread everywhere. It, it, it's 
occurs to me that um, perhaps uh, we, we don't yet have in global society as we look at the World Health Organization doing its best to do what it can, which is ostensibly, an, you know, the nexus point for the global health community, one would think, right? And so, you know, if you ever were to be able to put together like an early warning system, I'll keep saying it because that's what keeps coming into my head as you talk about all the, all the different pieces that, that if, if the community could evolve, right, the way that a sing, you know, singular cells become a multicellular organism, right, life evolves to a higher level. Could the scientific effort evolve to a higher level like we're trying to do at the Huck by bringing the disciplines together, the international community, the social, the, the field work, the lab work, all these different pieces, right? There's, there's not really anybody who would commission such an such a early warning system unless we had buy-in from the international community, right? Do you, do you think that politicians and people holding the purse, spring, purse strings internationally could be motivated to like put, put all their, their money together and, and, and put some policies in play that, that could help to map this, this global uh, early warning system that could then be deployed as we're talking about with the right principles to the different uh, countries and the different regions, bioregions, et cetera. Does that sound like a pipe dream or do you think we could uh, get there? I don't think it's a pipe dream. I mean, I think uh, WHO is the right organization to start something like this. And USAID started something like this about a dozen years ago. It's a, you know, it's a tens of billions of dollars operation to just, just to get started. So you, you do need, uh, you de- do need it to get started at these these very high levels, um, but you you do need uh, buy-in and interdisciplinary collaboration, as you know Sagan and Pete outlined in the way that their collaborations worked. But again, this is possible through large organizations like national governments and WHO. And after you set up these interdisciplinary teams, the next thing you need is data. And you know when you start, you have none of it, and then you spend a decade putting together lots of it. And one difference, for example, between coronavirus and avian influenza is that the avian influenza community over 20 years put together uh, an enormous bank of avian influenza genomes, um, spatial databases of uh, local farms where uh, outbreaks have been occurring. And all of this was made available slowly, some quickly, through partnerships and, and these types of collaborations that were sometimes national, but sometimes international and at a UN or WHO level. For coronavirus, we had nothing like this. And actually any, any chance of putting it together quickly took a hit this spring because in, in March and April, we sort of alienated the Chinese government and you know, didn't exactly invite them into future scientific collaborations. We you know, instead started blaming them for, for this outbreak. And you know, I imagine for you know, Pete and Sagan for the systems that you work in, I imagine they're in different stages of development where you either you know, do have enough local data to start putting together a, a mini surveillance system in some region, or maybe you're still a decade away because it's a, it's a disease system that requires a billion dollars of funding just to get the teams in place and just to collect all the data. That's like so, one fighter jet, $10 billion. It's not even a fighter jet. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, the irony <laughs> was that, um, we approached our funders and said, we believe we should be looking at beta coronaviruses in bats and we should be doing this sampling. And they told us, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. With hindsight, we're actually having our samples, the samples we banked looked at for beta coronaviruses. Anyway, I want to go back to your couple of points there. And I think, I think Majid brought up some of the very important points. So it, to my mind, WHO failed very badly during this outbreak. They really should have acted faster. They should have stopped. Um, they should have stopped movement of people. They should have consolidated this much earlier on than they did. I mean, by early January, I was convinced that this was going to go pandemic. And I think some of that failure also sits particularly with CDC China. They should have been acting. And it all revolves around the fact that we were talking, it's the politics of SARS, that China having already had a SARS outbreak, nobody really wanted to say this was a SARS virus because of the political you know, results of that. And that was, that was a major issue. If you think back to SARS-CoV-1, uh, the WHO did a remarkably good job. And the person who led that was David Heyman, an ex-Penn State alum. And David was the assistant director who stopped the movement of people coming out of uh, China and Hong Kong and Singapore at that time and stopped a pandemic. Now, it may never have taken place because, as Magic said, you know, transmission was different. It was a different 
virus. But I do think that David's actions, and he was told by the director general, well, if this works, and David told me this personally, that if this works, then WHO will look great. If this doesn't work, you're out of the job. So that sort of level of support and the politics involved is really ghastly. Imagine I brought up this whole point about the uh, data, and that's something that David Relman also brought up, that what we really need are easy access, rapid access to the data so that, we can, so that multiple people can work on those data and be able to do that in a reasonable way and do that fast and effectively. And I think the science community, as, as Magic said, we did it with influenza, and it, I think we should be doing it with a whole pile of emerging diseases. The politics is ghastly. And of course, the Trump administration stopped the pandemic committee that Obama and people had endorsed and supported during the time. And that was a real catastrophe as far as this country was concerned. As, as I said, back in early January, I was saying to my colleagues here and other universities, this is going to go pandemic. You've got to do something about this. Countries like the UK could have stopped it coming in. I think you know, if Trump had acted at the right time, he could have stopped it coming to this country. We could have taken action. We could have stopped it being as serious as it, as it is. And certainly, as I said, well, you know, New Zealand come out with the, probably a, a B plus, maybe an A minus, while most of the other countries are in E's and F's, I think, when it comes down to the results. So I think there are, so I think the scientists could help lead us out of this, but I worry about the politics. Yeah. And the politics in COVID-19 just being dreadful. I mean, Pete, Pete's right about the, the politics being difficult to, and ghastly. I, I just want to present the, the counter opinion to, to how good of a job WHO did, just for the listeners. I, I won't support either one. But the, uh, the, the worst example is often uh, given in China's response to the SARS outbreak, the SARS-1 outbreak which started presenting with um, unusual cases of undiagnosable pneumonia in October 2002, but it wasn't, uh, there weren't any cases that were described internationally until February 2003. So for four months, you had circulation in Guangdong province with essentially zero information coming out, except some news trickles that were then denied and pulled back and, 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 and redacted. Then the positive example uh, is always shown as China's response to the 2013 H7N9 avian influenza outbreaks. So the first patients with uh, unusual pneumonia appeared in the third week of February, 2013. And on March 31st, five weeks later, China had everything characterized and published and submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine. That's a rapid and open and successful response and the outbreak was stopped, but it took five weeks. And I don't think the China, Chinese CDC knew on December 30th that that five week window to get everything together, to sequence the virus, to develop the diagnostics and to begin the control procedures. I don't think they knew that that five week window wouldn't be enough. On, so December 30th was the point at which they realized something needed to be done. January 10th was the day that the sequence was made available and diagnostics could be made. January 13th, you had a case in Thailand. January 15th, you had a case in Japan. January 17th, you had a case in Korea. And in those 17 to 19 days, it just got away from them. I think we all knew at that point that it was risky. And I think they'd realized that they'd failed. But how much blame we should put on this response not being fast enough, that's subjective. And I wouldn't, um, I mean, I wouldn't blame, I wouldn't put too much blame either on China, CDC or WHO as if we you know, as if we had expected them to know that it needed to be done in those two weeks. So with hindsight, what should we, should, what should we and what could we have done? Uh, and I just don't mean us Americans or us, you know, the Western community, but the whole yeah. world should have done. What should we have been doing at that time? And I think... Uh, I think if we'd had our act together, we could have done it. But I do, I do appreciate your point. And there is, when it, there is an outbreak, it's ghastly because, you know, some people are saying this is not transmissible between people. And with hindsight, of course, we knew it was. But at the time, they were saying, yeah. it, we don't believe this is human, human transmission going on here. So Thank you. Thank you, Pete. There, there's an answer to this question. So WHO's big mistake 
in 2003 and in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic was uh, pushing forward the notion that airport closures don't work. And the reason they put forward uh, the airport closures don't work story is that they knew uh, or guessed correctly that no country would be able to close their incoming travel sufficiently to prevent the swine flu pandemic or the SARS outbreak from taking hold in a small group of people. They thought it was a total waste of effort. Airport closures, of course, do work if you close everything completely and don't let anybody in. But in both 03 and 09, WHO just viewed that as a completely unworkable strategy. But by the third week of January, when they noticed that it was spreading out of Hubei and into other provinces in China, and when they noticed that they had single digit number of cases in other countries, this was the moment to go back to, to reverse that one piece of advice and essentially to tell the, you know, the first two countries, Italy and South Korea that experienced major epidemics, this was the moment to tell other countries to close their airports and to stop all travel for three to four weeks. And that could have done it. So I think the pressure or the pressure that David Heyman always says is that the pressure on you is that this is going to hit the business world. And when you saw when they closed the airports, when they closed the east to west, that you saw a you saw a blip in the business productivity. And then it came back relatively fast. But it's going to take a while for this one to come. Yeah, you know, we talk about this on this podcast. It's sort of like the money, it's your money or your life, right? It's your and where are our values and what's more important, you know, human health and well-being or or the the almighty dollar. And and the fact that when when our government just whipped up a couple trillion dollars and handed it out kind of points to the absurdity of this imaginary money system we have anyway. And I think we need to get more creative about how we think about money because it's all a social construct anyway. Humans are real. Food is real. Houses are real, right? All, all these things are real. Medicine's real. Money is this imaginary exchange system that human beings created to exchange things. And so if we can bring forward new principles, uh, new values, if we can value health and well-being uh, more and kindness and, and, and international cooperation more and competition and beat the other guy less and, you know, we need to be the first um, if, if we can start to make that uh, change in our consciousness, uh, perhaps that will be the turning point that will allow us to, to, to work together more and, and do things like we're talking about, the whole international community working together to see the big picture, to put the pieces together for everybody's uh, well-being. So that, that's our hope. That's what we try to do in this podcast is to put forward some of these new ideas and, and raise the consciousness uh, of the people in our own little way uh, to help move us in that direction. And I thank all of you for everything you're doing to help uh, move science in that direction. So uh, we're just about at the end of our time together. It's been a fascinating conversation. Does anybody have any sort of wrap up comments, last things you'd like to share with our listeners and our viewers? Matchik, do you have uh, some last thoughts? Yeah, I'll just say about uh, the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we, we're not quite there yet in understanding which bat populations it came from or uh, how recently it may have jumped from bat populations to human populations. Probably what we're looking at in the next five to 10 years is a lot more sampling of wild bat populations in China and uh, sort of filling out the phylogenetic tree of uh, beta coronaviruses and Sarbeco viruses. And as we get viruses that are closer and closer, to the one that jumped over into humans at the end of 2019, we'll have a good picture of uh, how that spillover occurred and uh, where it could have occurred from. Thank you. Sagan, what about you? Any last thoughts for our folks? Um, I keep thinking back to your question of if we can predict spillover. Uh, and based on our conversation uh, and just observing the political climate, it's not only, I think, our ability to predict, but our ability to implement the changes that we uh, need to implement in order to curb spillover. Um, and I think that that's really, I mean, as scientists, as we're working really hard in these interdisciplinary teams, translating the science uh, into policy is a gap that I think is clear to all of us uh, and um, would really help. And I think from my perspective, it's very clear where human behavior comes into play here with uh, with increase in spillover in human dominated landscapes, uh, engagement in wildlife trade. We know these behaviors are risky and results in uh, spillover, but it's about implementing, uh, translating that science into policy um, that can really help us move forward um, as we continue to uh, elucidate 
the origins of some of these viruses. Absolutely, thank you. And Peter, do you wanna bring us home with uh, some last thoughts and comments? So while I am of course a scientist and a naturalist, I do believe very strongly that what we're looking at is an environmental issue here. This is taking place as a consequence of habit massive habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity, and we know this is immensely important in buffering infectious diseases uh, in the emerging disease scenario. So I feel very strongly that we have to really think about this in an environmental context, which you know might involve stopping habitat destruction, might involve large parts of the world changing their diet and the way we actually see the world. So I think, uh, I think this is a wake-up call, and I think it's about time we woke up. Well said. Well, again, thank all three of you for being on the Symbiotic Podcast today. It's been a fascinating and informative conversation. Uh, I, I thank you all for the good work you're doing to help advance science uh, globally, to help contribute to the evolution of science, and hopefully to a healthier and more equitable and, and more balanced uh, world where we're living more in, in harmony with, with nature and one another and um, creating a world where, where we can all do better together. So thanks again, everybody out there. Thanks for listening and don't stop co-evolving.